being here. Thank you for having me. Congratulations on the book. Thank you. Uh, let me ask, what prompted you to want to tell the story of your and Prince's love? What made you want to commit words to paper and let the world know what it was that you had? Um, it was really interesting because um, I've been wanting to write a story of my life for years. It wasn't just about Prince. But um, with his passing, uh, I had to really had to highlight the love story about this. But if, when you read the book, um, it starts with me being born with crooked legs and the irony of becoming a dancer, a professional dancer. And then from there, being a professional belly dancer to meeting Prince and then... You sent him a videotape, I right? sent him a videotape. <laughs> And, um, and then it turned into this amazing romance. And um, I want people, when they finish reading the book, to close it and go, damn, that was an amazing love story. And he's a cool dude. He's, in, he's the coolest dude. <laughs> he was the coolest dude. And it's an incredible love story that ends like a lot of love stories end tragically. Yeah. You know, it ends because of a tragic loss within that relationship. Um, did you want to give voice to other relationships or sort of help other relationships that go through that as well to show them what you went through? Yeah, I mean, that's... Um, when I lost my son, um, I read a lot of books um, to help me. And I, I realized that um, I think somebody reading this uh, hopefully will... I have this new saying. Somebody said it to me from my rescue. Uh, Never stop fighting for what you love. And I feel that um, just taking the moment and really telling somebody that you love them and, and fighting for it and never giving up. So it's also a motivational thing. Now I have to ask, <laughs> we all have relationships that, that end that we have to get over, but rarely do we have relationships with larger-than-life personalities. What is that like to have to sort of move on with your life after having a relationship with someone that, yeah, hate to say it again, but larger than life figure. Um, yes, he was larger than life, but he was my friend and he's a human being. And um, it's one of the reasons why he lived in Minnesota is because he got to be himself. He was a small town boy and uh, love is love. It doesn't really matter who it is and, and all that stuff. And I mean, I see, of course, and I, I, I had an amazing experience with him, but... Um, I, don't, I don't look at it like that. I just fell in love with him. When he passed away, what were your first thoughts? Uh, it was an out-of-body experience for sure. I don't know how many times I said no. Uh, I didn't want to accept it. Uh, I was actually driving, so I had to turn around and figure out how to get home. Kind of forgot how to drive and everything. It's, I can't really explain it. It's just one of those situations and unfortunately we're all going to have to go through that um losing someone that we love had you been in touch with them all at all in the in the past few years when was the last time the um, you had spoken i had spoken to him about five six seven years before that i had reached out to him a year before that and um i had gotten word uh it's in the book i had gotten word that he wasn't doing well in january and i was debating going to go see him bring my daughter don't not bring my daughter should I go now? Should I go on the weekend? Should I go during the day? And it was just this whole thing, and I was trying to get a hold of people, and um, I didn't go. I regret that, but I can't live in that. Um, but he knew. I mean, we had, we had a, definitely a connection. Was it difficult for you to write this book, to sort of go back to and day by day while you were writing, live in, live in the past, live in this relationship? Yeah, I mean, I had written some, some pieces... Um, just because I didn't want to forget. Um, it was tragic losing my son, but it was also all I had. And I, I had written certain things in my, in my journal. Writing it was hard, of course. Uh, but it was interesting because it just kind of fell into the most painful part. I, just, I didn't plan it. It just happened, and I went with it. And then once I, read it, I wrote it, it felt really... Uh, liberating and healing um, talking about it because so, for so many years I had to hide it and not really talk about it. Um, so yeah. Why did you have to hide it? 
Just, I mean, because when we, when we lost our son, he made the decision to not talk about it, to not announce it, and I respected that. It was really hard on me. I did Hollywood X's a couple years ago, a reality show, and I did talk about it, um, but I didn't, get in, I didn't get into detail. Um, and I felt like I needed to, and I feel that hole is still there, but it's, it's filled with uh, love, and I'm hoping that people get educated on, on fiber syndrome and, and stuff like that. It's, just, it's so, many, so many different things to, to think about. Um, yeah. One of the coolest things about your relationship that you talk about in the book is that he liked to hypnotize you. Yeah. And the two of you would sort of get hypnotized and talk about your past lives and yeah. this incredibly spiritual consciousness that's kind of sexy that the two of you had. Yeah. Did you continue that after the relationship or was that something that was really just between the two of you? No, actually, um, I never knew it, but it, we used the word hypnotize, but it was a form of meditation where you kind of bring yourself into your subconscious and and there's no there's no thoughts, kind of like when you meditate. And I do it, um, I do it when I dance. I do it when I... I do it a lot of times, <laughs> and I did it a lot while writing this book. And it was interesting because a lot of trauma has happened, um, had happened in my life, and I'd just forgotten it because um, to remember all the pain would have made me probably go crazy. So I had myself go into this meditative state, and a lot of things just came up and out, and, uh, and I was really happy that it did. I saw this interview that uh, uh, I think it was like a British morning show did with you just yesterday or the day before, and they seemed to pinpoint these moments in the book where they could kind of exploit the idea that Prince made you diet and Prince made you do this and Prince would dock your pay or something like that. Yeah, first off, that guy was not nice. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I was half asleep, by the way. I was like, because if I would have been awake, I would have been like, excuse me, we need to, I can't see you, but we need to like correct this right now. Well, it's so interesting because I think you write a loving tribute, but people are sort of looking for you to have written a, a, a tell, a yeah. salacious tell all that paints Prince as like a, a, a diva rock star who treated women in a poor light because we yeah. have that stereotype from previous rock star tell alls. But that's not yeah. this book. No, it's not. Um, yeah, he was trying to say he was controlling. I'm like, no, he's not controlling. I mean, everybody has a boss. They all have to listen to their boss. Yes, I was dating him, but we separated it. I was really good at doing that. And I respected his vision. I expected his environment. It was his world. And we were just adding to it. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, he I mean, was also look a prince. At it. He was fucking meticulous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was meticulous. But it, I, I mean, it, there's nobody like him. He's the best performer, was and is the best performer in the world. And no, this book wasn't about that. Um, yeah, he had, our, he had his things, he had his quirks, but he made me who I am. Were you worried at all when you were writing this book because he's such a larger-than-life figure, third time I said it, I apologize, <laughs> that even though it wasn't a tell-all a tell or it wasn't meant to be salacious, people, trashy journalists would pick up on the sort of quirks that you were just sort of using to illustrate what kind of person he was and try to turn it into stories like that? You mean like him stealing my clothes and stuff? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was funny. I, I, I don't really think it was a, a quirk. Um, but yeah, I mean, people would... The most that I'm getting from people is that they didn't understand how a 32-year-old man would be friends with a 16-year-old. But I keep saying this was in 2017 where there's twerking and kids are doing the craziest things. Back in 1990, 1991, it wasn't that crazy. And my parents trusted me. I was very professional. I started dancing at a very young age. I never cut school and... Do, did anything bad, smoking, none of that. Never did any of that. So they trusted me. And it was, um, it was a great relationship and friendship to start with. After the relationship and when you were writing this book, what did you realize that you had been holding on to about Prince the most? <sighs> that I've been holding on to. Or that you still hold on to, that you really take away with you from the your love. relationship with him. The love. Um, I, I'm proud that we had such a loving relationship, such a, I mean, we, we truly believed we were soulmates, and 
And um, I, I left with that, and, and I'll always have that. I mean, it also can, it gave me some kind of closure as well. I mean, um, doing this book and, and hopefully moving forward in my life, but it, it's, it's something, I mean, just like the tattoo, people ask me, why did I do that? I'm like, I believe, for me, tattoos are like scars, and I like to look at them, and they remind me of something, um, be it good or bad. Obviously, this is good. Prince is undoubtedly, undoubtedly the sexiest male performer there ever was. Him and David Bowie, probably. But yeah. Prince, so sexy that straight men will say, yeah, I'd sleep with Prince. <laughs> <You know? laughs> what was it like the, the first time you saw Prince not being sexy? The first time that he came out of a bedroom like in sweatpants and scratching his butt and was like, let's watch TV. That never happened. <laughs> no, come on. There had to be a moment in time where Prince was like, you caught him, like, you know, picking a bug or something, that he was just being a normal guy. Nope. <laughs> it never happened. He was always just the coolest, sexiest dude in the room, no matter what. I mean, even sick. I've, and I'd seen him sick with colds and stuff, and I'm like... Even sick, he was like... <clears throat> he still, he still... He coughed sexy. It was... It was... Yep. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, for me, don't forget, like, you know, people that... When you're in love... You know, they sneeze and you're like, oh, so cute. That's true. That is, that is true. I just, uh, uh, picturing Prince casually or just straight up in the, the most normal way possible is, is fascinating to me. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's no one like him. There's no one like him. I mean, this man could, could wear my clothes and still look sexy. He could wear heels. And there's no man, any man right now, that could wear heels and be like, it's just, it's, <laughs> it's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's turn it over to the audience for some questions. Who has some questions awesome. out here? Someone is right here. Hi, Maite. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank good you for you. being here. You look beautiful. Thank you. And thank you for writing this book. I look forward to reading it. But once you finish writing this book and you got the copy, you had it in your hands, what did that feel like once you read it through and you saw your story on, on, you know, on print? And what do you hope people will take away from after they finish reading your book? When I got the book and I read it in its completion with the pictures, I got really scared because I realized that I'd, I'd revealed a lot about myself. But I'm just at an age where I just don't care. It is what it is. And if you like me, cool. If you don't, cool. Um, I, I gave my heart. I, I, I gave it to him. And when you read this book, I hope that you get that he was an amazing human being, friend, musician. He was a little tyrant. But we all have our little quirks and things. Um, and he, I mean, for me, I really just wanted to show for the short amount of time that we had what a great father he was, dedicated father he was. Do you still listen to his music? I do. I am actually have a belly dance class at 7, which is why I'm dressed like this. And I always play for the warm-up one of his songs. What song are you going to play tonight? Today I'm feeling I would die for you. Maybe. Nice. Good choice. Yeah. There's really no bad choice with... with <laughs> no, there isn't. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Um, one of the things, I think you touched on this slightly in the book, but that's really surprising is how open you and Prince were with fans. Like, 20 years ago, you would chat with fans, right? Like, now everybody's on Twitter, and that's really normal. Yeah. I was wondering about, like, I think everybody saw both of you as so mysterious and hard to talk to, but what was that like, actually, like, interacting with fans, and what did you get out of that? What did he get out of that? Uh, I mean, I noticed in the beginning he was very, uh, I mean, and I get it. And it was a lot of, a lot of weird situations and some, sometimes dangerous situations. But I remember um, when we were married, I remember him having people, children from inner city schools come to Paisley Park and he would sit there and talk to them. And, and I love that because that's, that's just... I mean, that, that's the only way to, to help the youth and, and educate them and, and learn from them. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. I loved it. And, and I still, I love engaging with people and talking to them. And I mean, yes, the, the facade of being on stage, but there's a time and place for that. And I mean, I think, I think it's nice to have a balance of both. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, Maite. I read your People excerpt. I can't wait to read the book. Uh. And, um, you know, when Prince passed, one of the things we learned about him was that he was a philanthropist, and that wasn't known by a lot of people. So I would like to ask, what are three things that you think 
um, we don't know about Prince that we should know and that he'd want us to know and how you feel the fans should celebrate the legacy. First off, I do know that he would not want people to mourn him. I, want, I know that he would want people to celebrate him because he never feared death. He, he, it was like he just he didn't believe in that. And when you die, it's, you move and you elevate to a different level and of consciousness and all that. Um, Philanthropy-wise, he was very generous. There's many times that I would see him write checks to people and, and not want credit for it. I started Left One, one Another with him, and we started um, getting jackets for children and, you know, canned food for homeless people. And he, he motivated me to start my nonprofit. I have um, Mighty's Rescue, where I'm, I'm rescuing animals. And, and um, I'd love to continue in other, not just animals. I mean, it was, uh, he was always, always giving. He just he didn't want the credit for it. He would see how people would get that announcement and hand that check, and he wouldn't do that. Prince was uh, one of the most incredible, incredible guitar players we yes. ever had. Not, not just songwriting, but technically. Just unbelievable. How often did he play guitar around the house? Did he play it like someone who was practicing all the time? Or was it just he would just pick it up and be incredible? No, at the house, he never played guitar. He would play piano at the house. Um, guitar was always at rehearsal with, you know, the amps. And the, he needed the, the guitar tech to, you know, make sure that everything was on in tune and stuff like that. Um, acoustic on set sometimes, and, and uh, not really guitar at home. It was always piano. I'd hear it, I'd be like, God, I wish I had a camera, because I'd just go and look around the corner, and he'd be playing the most amazing things. He did teach me once. He goes, if you don't know how to play the piano, just play the black keys. I did teach, Nate, he did teach me that. <laughs> just so I would play just the sit there keys. and I'd be like, yeah, what do you think about this? <laughs> the book is, is so beautiful. You do an incredible job. It's on shelves right now, right? Yep. Thank you so much for being here. Everybody Thank go you. check out the book. Thank you so much. Thank you.